Hello, welcome everyone to Glaucoma Research Foundation webinar. Uh, we'd like to give you today an update with our Catalyst for a Cure vision restoration team. Before we start, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to participate and also to find um, a little bit of something extra to do so during a pandemic. Um, I want to assure everyone that we are all hard at work still um, working to restore vision in glaucoma patients. And it's very gratifying to see so many of you um, interested in receiving our update today. Today's very special. We're gonna hear from all four of our Catalyst for a Cure team members with some updates on the progress going on to restore vision in glaucoma. And we're gonna end with a Q&A period. And so I hope that you have uh, brought your thinking caps and are prepared to submit some questions. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. I'd like to take a moment to thank Airy Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring our program today, Glaucoma Research Foundation is a not-for-profit and our events and our educational materials, like most everything else that we do, require sponsorship. And so we're very, very grateful for the partners, not only in the private sector, but also in the biotech and pharmaceutical sector. So thank you very much, Airy Pharmaceuticals, for sponsoring today's event. I'd like to give you just a brief introduction of me. This is, this is what I look like. Um, I usually look uh, a little bit busier and, and not quite so dressed up as I too am a scientist. I am the vice chairman and director for research of the Vanderbilt Eye Institute, and I'm also the director of the Vanderbilt Vision Research Center here in Nashville, Tennessee, with some 55 vision scientists all working on different aspects of vision. Um, as you can see from the slide, my doctoral training is in neuroscience, which uh, encompasses studies of the brain and the nervous system. And that um, is a background that I leveraged uh, very well um, almost 20 years ago when I became a member of the very first Catalyst for a Cure team, CFC1, as we like to call it. And our purview for CFC1 was to dissect more carefully the mechanisms of progression that cause uh, neurodegeneration and vision loss in glaucoma. We were together for more than a decade as a team and produced some of the um, most important publications in the field of neurodegeneration in glaucoma. I'm still very much an active scientist and still studying degeneration in glaucoma. And I'm very, very pleased to have two roles now for the Glaucoma Research Foundation. First, I'm the chair of the research committee, um, which has input into the process for which research programs to fund, um, including the Schaefer Awards that we give out annually, and some of the other research-related events. Part of that is I have now become the chair of the third incarnation for the Catalyst for a Cure Scientific, Ad Scientific Advisory Board. And I'm joined by some stellar colleagues of mine um, who help oversee the results um, that are beginning to emerge of Catalyst for Cure to give advice to the four scientists, which sometimes they, they actually take, which is also gratifying. And I'm also active in other Glaucoma Research Foundation activities, um, including things like the webinar today. And so now what I would like to do is give a brief introduction of our four investigators. And as I introduce each, they will then take control of the slide presentation and give you a different aspect of the update. I want to emphasize that the Catalyst for a Cure is a consortium. It is designed as a model to produce more than the sum of its individual parts. And so with that in mind, the scientists are gonna focus on where their research fits into the collaboration that is the catalyst for a cure. Like most academic scientists, they have a lot of irons in the fire and other projects going on. Um, but today we're gonna focus on the great efforts in each of their labs to contribute to this wonderful consortium. 
And so our first speaker is going to be Dr. Derek Wellsby from the University of California, San Diego. Derek is not only a scientist, but also a clinician with a specialty focus on glaucoma. So he brings a special viewpoint to the consortium. So Derek, um, why don't you start and give us your update, please? All right, well, David, thank you very much. Uh, this actually, this is a photo of UC San Diego and the building that we are very fortunate to, to do our research in. This is the Altman Clinical Translational Research Institute building here in La Jolla. And I thought I would start off giving a brief background into what happens in glaucoma, because then it sets up what we need to do to fix the problem. And you know, I, I give similar discussions with patients all the time. So what you're looking at right here is just a picture of a brain and it's a cross section right through the head and I'm enlarging the eye. And if you looked in the back of the eye, you would see the retina, which is just like the film in the camera. And then I'm showing now a single nerve cell that lines the retina. We call that a retinal ganglion cell. And it has a fiber that connects that point on the retina to some corresponding point in the brain. And it travels, that fiber travels via the optic nerve. And so what happens when you see light hits that spot on the retina, the information gets processed, sent back to the brain, and you have vision. And so if you were to look at the retina, I'm only showing you a picture of one retinal ganglion cell, but actually there's about a million per retina. That's what they would look like. And that means if you looked at the optic nerve, you'd see about a million of those nerve fibers traveling through there. And if I, you know, we can't see all those retinal ganglion cells. When your doctor looks at your, at your retina, this is what we see. And we can see the optic nerve, the point where all those, those retinal nerve fibers come together. So what happens in glaucoma? Well, in glaucoma, I'm showing you here a little cartoon. Same thing we're looking at the, uh, what a, a doctor might see in the back of your eye, now superimposed with 12 retinal ganglion cells. And what happens in glaucoma is there's an injury to the fibers of those retinal ganglion cells. In response to that injury, the nerve fiber degenerates. That was actually work that was done by the first CFC team that identified that. We then have death of the retinal ganglion cells and the process continues as you lose more and more retinal ganglion cells and the optic nerve looks more and more excavated. And in some patients, it continues until all retinal ganglion cells have been lost. So what does that mean for the patient? Well, showing here is a typical visual field test that many of our patients get. That black spot is normal. That's just a uh, the physiologic blind spot. And remember that the optics of the eye invert things. So now I'm just gonna replay that animation to show how this impacts a glaucoma patient. So you have that same injury, you lose those same retinal nerve fiber cells, and then as you do that, you lose visual field because that point on the retina is no, lo no longer connected to the brain. And the process continues, more and more cells die, more of the retina becomes disconnected, and more and more vision is lost until for some patients, they've lost all the retinal ganglion cells, which means there's nothing to transmit information to the brain and they go totally blind. And so our current options for these patients are really just the cane and the dog. We need a strategy to restore vision to those who've already lost it. So what my lab works on, along with the other three labs here in the CFC, is how can we replace those lost connections? So we need to get the cells back into the retina. We need to have them regenerate their connections. And importantly, when you, with retinal ganglion cells, those cells that survive don't regenerate and vice versa, those that try to regenerate don't survive, but we need both of those things. So that's one of the questions that my lab has worked on. So how we've tackled this is using human retinal ganglion cells. But of course, my patients wouldn't like it if I pulled out their retinal ganglion cells. So we need a source of retinal ganglion cells. And we get that from human stem cells. We take blood from glaucoma patients, turn that into stem cells, and then from that, turn that into retinal ganglion cells. So this is a picture of actually one of the patients at the Shiley Eye Institute. This is their peripheral blood. We then make stem cells out of that. Those stem cells can be genetically modified, turned into little retinal organoids that can grow in culture. And then from those little 
retinas in a dish, we can get retinal ganglion cells from that patient. And then we can study them. And so what we do is something called high throughput screening, where we put the various retinal ganglion cells in plates, we injure their nerve fiber, just like what happens in glaucoma, and then we wait. And most of these cells will die because that's what happens to an injured retinal ganglion cell. But what we've made sure we've done is we've gone through each set of cells in each well, and we've made some intervention. We've either used genetic techniques or we use chemicals, but we do something to perturb gene expression. And we ask the question, well, did anything that we do improve the survival of those cells? Because if there is something that improves the survival, we've either identified a useful drug target or potentially a useful drug that improves retinal ganglion cell survival. And so we do this, we have the high throughput robotics to be able to look through you know, tens of thousands of wells and interventions. And then we can take pictures of these cells, see those that survive, and we can say, hey, what, geez, what, what did we add to that well that caused those cells to survive when the typical retinal ganglion cell didn't in all the other wells? And so we've identified drugs, we've identified gene targets. And this is actually some of the most recent work. I mentioned that the fundamental problem, or one of the fundamental problems with regeneration is that for a retinal ganglion cell, we can get them to survive or we can get them to regenerate, but it's very difficult to do both. So we did a screen where we asked what interventions would give a retinal ganglion cell both regeneration and survival. And we identified a set of genes that shown in purple give us the survival effect. And in red on the bottom, you're seeing the regeneration effect. So we're able to get both survival and regeneration. And that's something that we've been pretty excited about now leveraging for uh, this collaboration. You know, How can we now use that to improve uh, vision and restore vision? And so with that, I of course want to thank the people that actually do the work, which is all the people in my lab shown up there in the top right. Uh, collaborators, the CFC team, and of course, the Glaucoma Research Foundation. And with that, I'll turn it back to David. Thank you very much, Derek. We, we appreciate that. So now what I would like to do is introduce Ana Latore, who is, is not only a fantastic scientist, but also a fantastic friend to everyone at Glaucoma Research Foundation and the uh, collaborative team as well. And Anna has a little bit of a different approach to the consortium. Um, Anna, why don't you take over and tell us about your research, please? Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time and joining us today. Um, my lab is located in this beautiful campus uh, in Davis, um, about an hour away from San Francisco. And I'm going to start by um, thanking all the people in my lab who are really putting lots of effort to push this uh, project forward. So. Okay, here we are. Um, as Dr. Wellsby uh, just mentioned, the long-term goal of this team, of these four labs, is to really be able to develop a therapy to restore vision. And what we are aiming for is to try to replace, uh, in these very late stages of glaucoma, where the cells are already lost, what can we do? Well, what we are trying to do is a cell therapy, which in means that we want to um, introduce new cells uh, into this disease eye. Um, and as Derek already mentioned, there's a lot of challenges that we need to overcome for this to happen. The very first one is that we need a source of really good, suitable cells to do that. Then once we put the cells into the retina, they need to survive and they need to extend these fibers, these axons that not only need to grow, they need to contact the right parts of the brain and only the right parts of the brain. So there's a lot of challenges that we are trying to tackle. And the first one is the source of cells. And so my lab um, is working with stem cells um, as a source of donor cells for uh, cell therapy. And stem cells have two really important properties that make them really, really good, uh, suitable uh, source of cells. The first one is that they are able to divide almost forever. So from some of these uh, stem cells, we can make millions. Uh, and this is fairly easy in the lab. The other very interesting property of stem cells is that they have the potential to become any cell in the body, including, of course, the retina. And we learned a few years ago by the work of many different labs, the reagents and the chemicals that we need to add to the media 
to really direct stem cells and to become the right types of cells, in this case, the retina. And so we know that slowly in vitro, uh, the cells become, we like to call them retinal organoids, but really what they are is little balls of cells that end up producing all the different cells in the retina, including the retinal ganglion cells. And they are beautifully organized in these layers as a normal retina is. And we also learn how to uh, separate the retinal ganglion cells, purify them from the rest of the retinal organoids. And the good news is that the cells that we can make in a dish are able to extend these very long, beautiful fibers. Uh, so we have a good source of cells. In the lab and by means of this collaboration, what we've been doing is trying to make our own life a little easier by engineering these cells to express fluorescent proteins. These uh, proteins have colors, either red or green. And uh, what we are marking with these colors is the right types of cells that we are interested. Uh, for example, in this picture, we can see one of these lines that we engineered so that as soon as these stem cells become retinal cells, they turn up this red fluorescent protein and we can see them. And so this makes uh, monitoring these cells, when are they produced, how many are we making, are they surviving, uh, and many other parameters very, very easy for us to study. Um, this is one example of one of these organoids. And as I said before, in this one particular line, red are the retinal cells. And so we can see which part of this organoid is really retinal. We know that these organoids also make other parts of the eye, for example, this beautiful uh, pigment epithelia. And these uh, cells here are the retinal ganglion cells that we are interested. The second challenge, okay, uh, at this point, we are happy uh, to some extent because we can make the right cells. Uh, to make this cell therapy a possibility, but they still need to be able to survive, to be healthy enough so we can transplant them, and then they need to extend the axons to the right centers of the brain. Um, so to tackle the first next question, which is how can we get them to survive, we are really looking into the drugs that uh, Dr. Welsby is uh, finding in, in his lab that protect from glaucoma, and we are asking, can the same drugs that protect these cells from dying protect the stem cells that we generate in culture so when we can transplant them? When we transplant them, they survive better. And so, so far, we found uh, some compounds that are really working. And not only the cells that we make are healthier, but they also seem to have longer and healthier axons, uh, these fibers, uh, which is really, really good news. And so the next step, and probably the most challenging one, but um, it's very exciting for us, is that we are starting to try some transplants. And we are using cutting edge life imaging technologies to really follow the cells that we transplant over time and ask what's happening with them. Are they surviving? How many of them are surviving? Are they extending axons? And what's happening over time uh, in these eyes? Uh, so this is very new work. We are working on that and I'm very excited. Um, so now I'm going to turn to my colleagues, but before I want to thank all my collaborators uh, and especially the Glaucoma Research Foundation uh, for all their support. Thank you so much, Anna. We appreciate that very much. So now I'd like to introduce our next colleague, Yang Hu, um, who's also a clinician scientist like Derek and he's in the Department of Ophthalmology at Stanford University. Yang, why don't you take control and tell us a little bit about how you're contributing to the collaboration, please. Okay. Thank you, David. And uh, we are really very fortunate to uh, be in this uh, CFC uh, effort. And uh, my lab is ma majorly focused on in vivo testing neural protection and axon regeneration strategies and uh, to develop uh, gene therapy for the glaucoma treatment. And uh, as I just, before I get into the detail, I want to show you that uh, this is the lab uh, that uh, we are working on. And this is the address, uh, which is off campus of Stanford, uh, which is um, quite uh, easy uh, to access. And uh, we have free parking, and everyone can visit us very easily. And we can collaborate with uh, collaborators uh, uh, very conveniently. And uh, the 
the lab is a uh, day-to-day life. Uh, life is looks like this. It's very busy, very crowded, uh, but uh, that's what we uh, used to do. And uh, my lab has two locations. One location is uh, majorly bench work. Another location is majorly focused on animal work that uh, we have uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, imaging facilities uh, in within the animal facility. So we can, uh, using that, take advantage of that to look at the in vivo activity uh, morphology of the retinal ganglion cell and the oxymoron uh, in the mouth. And uh, again, we are really uh, grateful for the support from the CFC from uh, Glaucoma Research Foundation. Uh, this is the individuals that in my lab is supported uh, by this effort. And uh, they are involved in the project that I'm going to talk about that related with this CFC uh, research. So uh, we think that uh, we need to test anything we identify on the batch, a bunch, and then uh, into in vivo animal uh, uh, models. So that's one of the efforts in my lab is try to uh, develop novel and more efficient glaucoma models. And uh, one of the models we recently developed is that uh, we got the idea from clinic that uh, in patients, uh, there's a secondary glaucoma caused by the silicon oil injection that when treatment for the retinal degeneration. And uh, we testing this idea in the mouse eyes, which uh, works uh, essentially very well and is can induce uh, IOP elevation very significantly, very stably. And another good thing about this model is that we can remove the silicon oil and then to lower down the IOP back into the normal very fastly. So that in this model is a reversible glaucoma ocular hypertension model. Using this model, we can combine with the uh, IOP treatment uh, with other neuroprotection treatment to look at the combination effect in this model. And uh, this is how we uh, estimate the degeneration. So um, this individual uh, right dot is the retinal ganglion cell that we can uh, quantify. And this individual circle in this picture is that uh, is individual axons in the optical neural uh, by quantify the number of the surviving retinal ganglion cell or surviving axons, we can have a, a very uh, definitive answer for the degeneration or any treatment effect on those models. Uh, we, we, we cannot forget another almost half of the population uh, that has the glaucoma, which is not IOP related, which so-called normal tension glaucoma. We also have an effort to develop a normal tension glaucoma model which is majorly using that uh, uh, known genes that has um, causative, uh, the mutation of the genes that has a causative effect on the glaucoma uh, degeneration. So actually, uh, previously, um, the, the genetic model for the normal tension glaucoma, it takes much longer time to, to show the effect. And we recently, by accident, we found another uh, model that uh, within several weeks, we can detect uh, significant degeneration by single gene mutation. So that will be uh, also for facilitated us to testing normal uh, without the IOP element in, in those patients, how we can tackle the neurodegeneration. Another effort in the lab is that uh, since we are working on in vivo animals, so we want to have a way uh, in vivo longitudinal modulate uh, monitor the progression of degeneration or recovery after treatment. One way is using uh, OCT, we can measure the ganglion cell complex, which is reflect the degeneration of uh, healthy of the uh, ganglion cell and their axons on the surface of the retina. Uh, we, this is actually has been uh, uh, used in eye clinic for human patients. Uh, we also uh, take advantage of the in vivo imaging technique uh, to look at the fun uh, founder's image of the retina to follow exactly the same animal, same area uh, to look at their degeneration along the time. And also hopefully we can look at the neuroprotection effect, uh, looking at the same animal, same area, same, even same cell to look at their uh, uh, neuroprotection and the repair. 
So that's another uh, effort. We, in addition to that, we also want to look at the individual artist's activity uh, in response to the degeneration of neural protection. All this have not been uh, applicable in clinic because we have to fluorescent label the retinal ganglion cell. But I think this is a foundation for in the future that we can apply this once there's a technic breakthrough that we can label the retinal ganglion cell in the human patient. Then we can look at using this knowledge that we get from the animal to look at that. And uh, another effort in the lab is to try to develop a gene therapy uh, uh, strategy. And uh, as you know, that if we want to target a uh, retinal ganglion cell, we don't want to affect other cells uh, in the retina to uh, minimize the side effect. One of the efforts we recently uh, I, uh, achieved is that uh, we identify one retinal ganglion cell specific promoter. So we, we identify this uh, mouse SNG promoter, which is uh, much more potent and a specific uh, label, uh, uh, drive genes expression in, ret in mouse retinal ganglion cell. And uh, we prove this, uh, also test this promoter in human uh, IPS derived stem cell, uh, di differentiate uh, ret uh, human retinal ganglion cell, which is uh, showing the efficiency of this promoter to drive genes expression. We also modify this promoter to drive Cas9 expression in the retinal ganglion cell in mouse in vivo, which can uh, shows that the efficiency of uh, CRISPR Cas9 mediate the gene modulation in retina uh, in mouse retina in vivo. Lastly, that uh, we want to combine uh, all this uh, effort that we have to achieve. Uh, Exon regeneration in addition to the neural protection. This is shows that uh, we can readily label the regeneration exon in the optic nerve uh, once we modulate the genes that involve in neural protection and the regeneration. And uh, we have really uh, extensive collaboration uh, among these uh, uh, four labs. And uh, here I list some projects that we are uh, currently going on. Uh, first, uh, we, we collaborate with uh, uh, Derek Westby's lab and uh, to look at the, the two very critical genes that he identified uh, called DLK and LZK that is important, uh, very uh, uh, efficiently uh, protect retinal ganglion cell in response to injury. So we are going to test this in the animal model that we developed to see what, what's the efficiency that we can look at uh, in the uh, in vivo uh, work. And uh, in addition to that, we also want to combine the neural protection and the optimal regeneration genes together to see whether we can boost the regeneration to achieve better neural protection. And the collaboration with uh, Dr. Xinduan's lab at UCSF, we want to more carefully to study the individual subtype of retinal ganglion cell, uh, their uh, response to the ocular hypertension and the response to the neural protection and the regeneration as well. And the, of course, we also collaborate with uh, Anna's lab to look at the cell-based, uh, stem cell, uh, cell-based uh, cell transplantation in the immobile glaucoma model to see how can we achieve better uh, survival of those uh, stem cell derived RDCs uh, in the immobile environment. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Yang. We appreciate that update very much. So what I'd like to do now is complete our updates by moving on to our last collaborator and speaker for the day, Zin Duan, who is at the University of California in San Francisco in the Department of Ophthalmology and also in Physiology. So Zin, why don't you tell us how your research complements what we've heard so far from the Catalyst for a Cure. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, um, David, for this uh, very kind introduction. Thank uh, the Glaucoma Research Foundation and many of you who support this great initiative. So I'm very honored to be part of this vision restoration uh, initiative, Catalyst for Cure uh, Team 3. So in the next five to 10 minutes, I'm just gonna briefly cover what has been achieved as this great, a great collaboration. And just very briefly uh, about my laboratory at UCSF and 
some of you have visited us uh, in the past and I'm looking forward to uh, meet many of the new uh, 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 many of the new friends and from through Glycoma Research Foundation. So uh, this is the lab and then we are very we're relatively junior as a team and we're part of this department of ophthalmology. So in the summertime, the entire team and also the vision clinic will move to this beautiful new uh, clinics at Mission Bay campus. And this will open, uh, especially with the reopening of the university, we're looking forward to meet, welcoming you, many of you to visit us in the near future, okay? So uh, just to, uh, to, to uh, come back to, uh, uh, to emphasize the, the effort, uh, we have started to build through the CFC1, CFC2 uh, collaborations, there has been increasing effort on the cell survival and on the quality of the cells and improving the, the transplantation. And one of the ultimate goal for the Catalyst for Cure uh, Team 3 is to really uh, come with efficient methods to rewire our eye to the brain and to give us a functional vision. So through this collaboration at my junior team, we have uh, explored the several things uh, in collaboration with the other CFC3 teams. So why is to understand how our different type of retina neurons are really responding to the disease and injuries. And this is through a collaboration with Yan and Anna's group where we try to use genetics approach and molecular approach to understand how individual cells are uh, different in response to uh, injuries and disease. And the second is really to come with in, uh, re really innovative approach to understand what our individual neurons and cells are responding in terms of utilizing such intrinsic responses to drive the regeneration and re, uh, reforming of this, uh, the function. And last but not least, uh, through this extensive collaboration, we have re uh, established new functional uh, approaches based on electronic signals and imaging uh, capacities to understand how our retina neurons are remaking the synapses to the brain recipient areas. In other words, how does our eye inform our, inform our brain in terms of the functional vision, okay? So on the, as uh, our team member have introduced to you, and we focus on this very interesting population of cells that's called retina ganglia cells that send very long axons from the retina to the brain. What we haven't told you so far is really, even though it's a very small piece of the tissue sitting back on the back of our eyes, they come in many, many flavors. In the mouse and in the human, it comes in tens or 20 flavors. And essentially it tells us different flavors of the color, of adapt color adaptation and direction and motion and, and so on. So when we explore this diversity, we understand they are very different. So we understand who are the neurons that really selectively responding to the different uh, functional vision. In this effort, we have generated transgenic uh, uh, lines and that is first established in the mouse system. And many of the, much of the work was uh, uh, established uh, when I was a postdoctoral fellow with Josh Sainz in collaboration with Dr. Ji Gang He, who is also a, a board member of uh, uh, of Glycoma Research Foundation. So using such genetic and imaging approach, we try to understand how different cells respond to the injuries and diseases. And through such effort, we were able to make a very uh, interesting finding that only five to 10% of the cells respond to the uh, stimulation very efficiently. And this is uh, really through the uh, very careful examination. In, in collaboration with the CFC3 team, we start, started expanding this uh, uh, discovery in the mouse system and onto non-human primates, and hopefully to make the link to the human patients. So we, when we establish the work, we focus on multiple factors, as you can imagine, in terms of the extrinsic stimulation, in terms of the increasing pressures, but more importantly, we focus on the intrinsic factors that is endogenous to the neurons that respond to the injuries and diseases. So when we really open up these uh, things and in collaboration with Anna and uh, Young, and we started to uh, explore what are the different intrinsic factors. And just to give you one example, again, this is a, a, a very beautiful example where the intrinsic cues, such a, a very interesting molecule we find through this uh, collaboration and discovery that they can be utilized as the interest, intrinsic factors through this transcriptomic approach where we can assign the intrinsic cues to one population of cells. And more importantly, when we try to overexpress it, when we try to rejuvenate the cells with the same factors, uh, for your information, this is a soluble factor that can be delivered through the uh, animal eyes. 
And when we try this, in, and we can show robust axonal over uh, axonal regrowth from the retina to the brain. And this has really opened up the uh, possibility where we can use intrinsic factors in, uh, to stimulate the growth. And in collaboration with the CFC three teams, we're trying to understand what are the mechanism underlying such uh, uh, factors. Uh, this is a work uh, uh, through a collaboration of a resident uh, Victoria and a postdoctor fellow Kenichi in the lab, where we try to utilize this in collaboration with Derek's teams and Young's team to understand what are the mechanism underlying this uh, progress and what are their responses to glaucoma and how can we really understand the uh, upstream downstream signaling in terms of applying it to the in vivo setting. Okay, so hopefully in the next chapter, in the near future, when we come back again, I can tell you a lot more about the funding through this great collaboration of CFC3. So with all that, I'd like to, again, thank you, thank the Glaucoma Research Foundation. Thank many of you for your uh, uh, amazing uh, contribution and support to this great initiative and my team members for all your, um, uh, all your uh, help and great collaboration. Thanks again. Okay, thank you all very, very much for those updates. It's gratifying to see uh, the amazing progress that our Catalyst for a Cure team is making in really bridging some of the major gaps between loss of vision and restoring vision. We've got a number of questions from our attendees today, a lot of interest in clinical trials. And so what I would like to do is parcel the question so that everyone has an opportunity to handle at least one question. Um, we may not get to all of them, and I may paraphrase certain questions because there are um, some that overlap uh, into, into a particular subject area. So first, let's, let's get the elephant in the room addressed, COVID-19. So Derek Wellsby, are there telltale signs of changes in the eye due to COVID-19? Now, before you answer, we don't want to spend a lot of time on, on COVID uh, today. We want to spend most of our time on, on glaucoma. So Derek, go ahead and give us a brief answer. Brief answer is yes. I mean, certainly patients with COVID-19 can develop a conjunctivitis or a red eye, but the reality is that's probably the least of their issues. Also, we don't know the frequency by which it happens. And the most important question that we still don't know the answer is, is how contagious is it? Is this a way that people spread COVID or is it just an incidental finding? So I think the answer is we don't know yet. And certainly the National Institute has an interest in finding out the answers to those kinds of questions. Is that right, Eric? Correct. Good. Okay. Next COVID-19 question. We've mentioned that um, we're all doing our best to maintain science as things um, are a little bit difficult these days. Uh, so Anna, is it, is it really business as usual? And what is it that you're doing uh, to address some of the constraints in your lab due to the shutdown? So it is not business as usual. Um, we have a sheltered in place mandate, uh, but we are allowed to maintain minimal operations in the lab, which means that what we are doing is uh, people can go to the lab, but always keeping the safe social distancing. So we establish a shift system. So not too many people are in the lab at the same time. Uh, they have PPE, they have masks, they have gloves, they can protect themselves. And we are still keeping, um, of course, the animals and ourselves uh, because those take months um, to grow. Um, and we're trying to do our best to still keep things ongoing. At the same time, we have lots and lots of Zoom meetings uh, where we uh, read papers, discuss ideas. Uh, we have multiple uh, of these uh, lab meetings uh, every week uh, to still keep the productivity, even if it's more intellectual uh, at this point. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, it's hard. Zen, I know that you've been sleeping in your lab. Is that correct? <laughs> So in that case, it's business as usual for you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Yang, you talked about different forms of glaucoma, and we've got a couple of questions about that. The goal to restore vision using regenerative therapies that you all have discussed today. Yang, do you anticipate that the potential or experimental therapies that we come up with will apply to whether a patient has lost vision 
due to primary open angle glaucoma versus lost vision through normal tension glaucoma? I think what we are trying to uh, study, it doesn't really matter what's the etiology of the degeneration. So uh, we think uh, as long as the, uh, the degeneration happening, and uh, if we can prevent the uh, degeneration or promote regeneration, uh, that should be applied to uh, uh, both conditions. Although the tiny, tiny difference uh, molecular mechanism uh, induced the upstream of this degeneration machinery may be different by different way of injury or either physical injury or LP elevation or, or there are some genes degeneration. But the, down to the common uh, pathway that uh, really initiate the degeneration, we believe that it may have uh, the same common pathways. If we can identify those pathways, that will benefit for all kinds of different uh, patients. Yeah. Great. Thank you very, very much for, for that information. Then when we are performing our experiments in the laboratory, we use um, tools such as reporters. And you can, you can stick a molecule into a stem cell and you can make it glow. Zen, one of the questions has to do with how will we know we're successful in a human patient? Are we going to be able to use reporter stem cells or are we going to have to create new tools? Yeah, th thanks for that great question. So to rephrase a little bit, so basically how can we translate our findings from the mouse, the lower species, onto primates, including monkeys and ourselves? So the short answer is yes, we are making that progress. And it's certainly, I mean, the, thanks to great technology innovation through the great community. So we are at the right time to do this for the following reason, that we use reporters such as a fluorescent protein or transgenic tags to make such finding in the mouse or other species. Once the findings are there, the molecular underpinning, meaning the molecules or the drugs that we discovered can be, can be parallelly expressed and examined in higher species. So molecules such as osteopontin or other factors uh, such as the growth factors we have discussed are, are very evolutionarily conserved and have great implications in higher species. And thanks to the technology innovation on top of all of these molecules is the fact that, for example, now by taking the information from the mouse, by looking at the cell type of the information such as introduced, and when we look into the mirror image in the higher species, we now have principles and clues to understand which cells are the one we can intervene and make the next targets to be available. I think that's just really the right time to do this from, uh, from lower species onto primates and humans. Thanks that's for that great question. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. And, and Zin, you alluded to milestones. Um, having been a part of the Catalyst for a Cure now for almost 20 years, I, I understand the importance very well of setting milestones. Anna, our attendees today are very interested in understanding how do we monitor progress that we've made and what kind of a timeline do you foresee before moving something into the clinic? That's a great question. Um, so like anything else in science, it's hard to really predict, uh, but the timeline is to first do these studies in mice uh, we want to be able to transplant cells in mice because this allows us to do many, many experiments and to really follow what's happening to the cells in uh, this species first. And once we found the right conditions, the right molecules that promote survival, and uh, we need to look into how these axons, these fibers from the ganglion cells are growing, um, then at that point, which I think is going to be in uh, maybe three to four years, uh, then we'll be able, hopefully, uh, to move uh, forward um, and to look at the next stage of, of uh, translating uh, our research into a clinical uh, therapy, really. That's great. And Derek, would you like to add to that answer? Yeah, I, I think one thing that's important to consider is that this is not a linear path forward. And so, the ultimate goal, of course, is to restore vision to those who have lost all vision, but there are multiple shorter term milestones. For instance, preserving the retinal ganglion cells that you have and enhancing their function 
And just so people know, there are clinical trials around that now. So we're not talking about the distant future here for all of this. Good. That, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so, Derek, do you anticipate that a patient in a clinical trial now for, let's say, a, a, an experimental therapy, um, maybe a neuroprotective therapy, would be eligible a few years down the road for a catalyst for a cure trial? I mean, I guess the devil's in the detail. It has to do with the stage of disease of the patient matched up with the risks and benefits of the intervention. So you can imagine if the intervention ultimately ends up being an eye drop, then lots of people are gonna be eligible. If the intervention requires surgery, we're gonna to need to restrict that to those with the most severe disease. And so right now we, don't, we can't forecast what that balance is gonna look like. Great. For a hypothetical trial. Hypothetical, but we're hopeful. Correct. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to get back to that point in, in just a few minutes in, in the end. Thank you very much, Derek. Yang, a question for you. Let's suppose that we are successful in transplanting stem cells, turning them into ganglion cells, and having them sprout axons into the optic nerve in a patient um, who has lost most of their optic nerve fibers. Do you foresee that those axons are going to find their targets naturally in the brain and form the right connections in the brain? Or do you believe that we're going to need a catalyst for a cure part four in order to demonstrate that the circuitry in the brain is uh, forming in a way that is going to preserve or restore vision? That's a great question. That's also the question that uh, on everyone's mind in this CF3. And uh, we know that uh, from publication, we know there are some uh, lab can achieve the uh, regeneration of the axon grow long enough into the brain. And uh, uh, there are some form of uh, vision recovery from that, so which is very encouraging. Uh, but in our own hands, we haven't been able to achieve uh, that long uh, range of axon regeneration yet. And uh, that's why we need to really study that. Uh, especially in animal model. Uh, I cannot predict uh, because, you know, uh, during development, uh, there's a totally different environment to allow the axon the, uh, during development to reach to their central target. But uh, after development, in the adult uh, uh, age, can the regeneration re refine their correct target or not? That's a very important question. But currently, we don't have really have very potent uh, 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 regeneration to allow us to test that in a very extensive form. But the, from what currently uh, published is uh, encouraging. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Anna, would you like to um, add something to that answer? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So this, uh, to me, it was one of my main worries. If, uh, you know, we can generate ganglion cells in a dish, we can transplant them, but what's going to happen? Are they going to connect to the wrong place? What we know for now, uh, Dr. Hu is absolutely right. We don't have enough data yet to really uh, say. But what we know is that the new axons of the, of the cells we add really like to bind to the axons that are still there. So even if there's just a little bit of optic nerve left, what we know is those axons like to grow on top of the axons that are there. And so just because of this property, I'm a little hopeful that they'll be able to make it to the right parts of the brain because they're growing on the nerve that's still there. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Zin, let's talk about sources of patient-derived stem cells. We know that we can get things from blood from patients. Zin, do we anticipate that we'll be able to take a swath through the aqueous humor or the tear film or from the vitriol body of the uh, patient to derive stem cells? What do you think? Yeah, this is a great question. So we have been uh, talking about this, you know, being, come back to the COVID uh, shutdown. Four of us have been continuing this discussion scientifically, intellectually to talk about this. This is a great time. So we thought about this being two phases. If any of the swab, any of the vitreous uh, thing that provide early pre, uh, you know, pre-disease diagnosis, that's already one step forward, right? Because especially with all the newer technology, dealing with tiny amount of proteins from the, the vitreous humors and from the, all, all these sources, 
if some three diagnosis biomarkers can in, inspire the diagnosis, that's sufficient. I feel like realistically, we're really building on top, I mean, on the shoulders of the giants who are the regenerative medicine people who have, you know, went down and regenerated many other parts of the body. So through the realistic work, you know, as Anna and Derek already inspired us, basically this patient blood cells and also the epithelium of the swab really provide a reliable source to reprogram into the cells we're interested in. And then this is really a platform that we have established as CFC3 team, we can build upon. So right now the challenge is really to, can we really amplify this and can we really make it at a, at a functional and, a, and a useful level? And that, that's really a challenge of our team. And we are but at the right time. Thing is, is it's a challenge of scaling up. Exactly, yes. To get sufficient numbers of donor cells from, from a patient. That's exactly right. Right, and that's one of the challenges that, that we face. Luckily, retina is very achievable. It's small enough for a lot of this uh, uh, established protocols to further improve and really to bring to the next level compared with another chunk of the brain. Think that way. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We've got one more question that I'm, I'm going to say for, for last. I think what, what we've heard so far indicates that the Catalyst for Cure is making tremendous strides forward in programming cells to become retinal ganglion cells, and in transplanting those cells into experimental models, ranging from retina in a dish to, um, what, to, to monkey work as, as well. And these are very, very, very important. But it's going to take time. Catalyst for a Cure has been, has, has been going on for nearly 20 years now. We've made incredible advances um, that I think have captured the imagination not only of the public, like our attendees today, but also of, of our fellow scientists. But these things take time. Derek Wellsby, right now, if a patient comes in and is, is losing vision, is there a clinical trial or evidence for a vitamin supplement or a dietary supplement that can that is proven in human patients to help them slow progression? I get this question a lot. And there's not an easy answer, but I'll tell you supplements. There are several that I think are very encouraging. I'm not gonna name names because if I, to name a name, I would have to talk about the evidence for and against. And I'll just tell you, there are no randomized clinical trials that clearly show any supplement makes a difference. So it's something that might happen in the future the best evidence actually, and again, it's not randomized controlled clinical trials, but there's decent evidence around this, has to do with green leafy vegetables and exercise that gets your heart rate up. So, you know, eat healthy and exercise, and those things actually might have a different, make a difference for glaucoma progression. Supplements, I would say, let's, we'll see. There are some very promising concepts, and I'll, we'll see if it pans out. So it certainly can't hurt for all of us to get more exercise to maintain a healthy diet with lots of antioxidants and green leafy vegetables and, and things like that. And, and, and certainly the, the better our overall health is, we anticipate that that will improve how patients respond to treatments both today and also the experimental treatments that Catalyst for a Cure will be generating in the years to come. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, Derek. And thank you to our panelists as well. And what I would like to do now is to remind everyone that Glaucoma Research Foundation is open for business. And what you see on your screen are the wonderful, amazing staff members of Glaucoma Research Foundation based in San Francisco. They are very, very much like our scientists. The work doesn't stop. They are always available for your questions. The website is a fantastic resource. They are a wonderful group of people serving not only the research mission, but also patient outreach and education. Thank you all so very much for participating today. We hope to see you again in person, hopefully in the not too distant future. Meanwhile, please stay healthy and keep the faith. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Tom Mitro here. 
The program you've just watched and the remarkable research progress it highlighted are among the many reasons why Erie is very proud to be a longtime supporter of the Glaucoma Research Foundation. Now, our company was founded to pursue innovation in glaucoma. We know this happens in the laboratory as well as in the interactions between doctors and patients. That's why GRF's dual mission of supporting research for a cure and educating and encouraging patients is just so powerful. Please join us in making or renewing your own generous contribution. Thank you very much.